human brain, the most incredible, fascinating organ in our human body. In the normal, healthy human brain, there are over 100 billion brain cells, all connecting, interacting, and communicating to tell our body how to function, our heart how to beat, our organs how to process food and nutrients. But even more than that, the ability to move, to coordinate our movements, to walk through a door, to tell us what we feel, see, hear, touch, and the unexplained individual personality that we have, our emotions, our memories, and our dreams, all controlled by this incredible organ. It is the most incredible supercomputer on the planet. But unfortunately, when things go wrong, they go terribly wrong. Hands up, how many of you have a friend or family member suffering from a neurological disease or a brain injury? <coughs> so one in 50 New Zealanders suffer from neurological disease or brain injury. Neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and injuries such as spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and stroke. What makes this even more scary is that as our elderly population expands and we live longer, by 2050, 150 people in New Zealand will suffer from Alzheimer's disease. This is going to be a huge economic cost to families and to the New Zealand government and economy. So we have done a lot of study and research into the human brain, but there is still so much we don't know. We are attempting to develop new drugs and treatments to try and cure brain injuries and brain diseases. But as yet, we have no effective therapies for any of these diseases. Or injuries. Why is that? Well, the reason is because the majority of work that's done identifying and testing new drugs, new therapies, is done on rodents. And rodents are not humans. Even when you move into non human primates, they are still not humans. You may not like this, but the rodent brain is relatively similar to the human brain, but it's not exactly the same. There are certain genes that are not expressed or are expressed at different times. Some cell functions are different and some enzymes are different. So usually a drug does not reach a human until it goes into clinical trial. And this is why only 0.01% of any drug that goes into clinical trial ever actually makes it through to the patient. Because we are testing and developing these drugs not on humans. So what I want to tell you about today is to move you into the future. I'm going to tell you a story that 10 years ago even I would have told you was science fiction but is now a reality and is becoming the new face of medical research. And this is a process known as cell reprogramming. Cell reprogramming was not developed until 2007, so it's relatively new in the field. Sinjai Yamanaka at the University of Kyoto presented the ability to take a skin cell obtained by a simple skin biopsy, and overexpress four genes that are found in embryonic stem cells. And what happened was that over a couple of months, those skin cells turned back the clock and went back to become embryonic stem cells. 
Okay, they went back in time. They acted, they looked, and they functioned exactly like an embryonic stem cell that is found in a blastocyte after conception. Now it's those embryonic stem cells that make the cellular building blocks from which a mature human body is formed. He named these cells induced pluripotent stem cells. Now the word pluripotent is very important here. This is what makes these cells and the embryonic stem cells so important. Because a pluripotent stem cell has the ability to turn into any tissue or organ in the body, which for biomedical research is really, really exciting stuff. So we can take pluripotent cells, whether they're embryonic or induced, and we can make skin tissue, we can make muscle, we can make heart, we can make lung tissue, and we can make brain tissue. But there's one catch here. Pluripotency is really exciting, but it is probably the main issue why embryonic stem cells and unfortunately induced pluripotent stem cells may not ever reach the clinic. Because pluripotent cells have the ability to turn into all types of tissue in the body, they also can make tumours. And it has been a very difficult and almost at the moment impossible process to completely remove the pluripotency. So, this was a real breakthrough. We can take a skin cell and we can turn it all the way back in time to an embryonic stem cell. Now, I have a postcard that I got from Denver Airport quite a long time ago, and it sits in my office, just to remind me on those bad days. And it says, trust your crazy ideas. I always tell my students that science is actually a creative process. <laughs> we often think about science as being very analytical, very organised, and very predictive. And it does need to be, to some extent. But it also has to be imaginative. It has to be constructive. It has to deconstruct. And you have to think outside the square for that really unique outcome. So my interest, of course, is trying to develop new ways to treat brain injury and brain disease. And in order to do that, we need to understand more about how cells become diseased in instances like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, and try and identify targets that we can develop new drugs for. Or we could do cells for cell replacement therapy. We need to try and find a source that is going to be useful for that purpose. So <clears throat> when the cell reprogramming work came out from Japan, of course it really lit a fire inside me and I thought, okay, how can we use this? We don't want to have a pluripotent stem cell though. We don't want the issues of pluripotency. So my team and I sat down and we thought about this and we came out with a novel concept which is called direct reprogramming. So like the cell reprogramming that Yamanaka developed, we too take adult human skin cells. But instead of the factors that Yamanaka used, we use two genes that are involved in making the neural tube, which then goes on to form the brain. And these two genes are known as SOX2 and PAX6. Now what we do is we take our human skin cells and we force these two genes, SOX2 and PAX6, inside the cell so that cells then start expressing these genes in the protein. Now in your cells, in your body, the cells in your body have all the genes that make up you as a person. As a cell matures, some genes get turned off and others get expressed, depending on what type of cell that 
that the cell is going to become. But these genes that have been turned off, they're not completely turned off. They're just silent. They're dormant. So what happens when we put SOX2 and PAX6 in is that it stimulates and turns back on the SOX2 and the PAX6 that was turned off way back in development when those tissues and those cells went on to become skin cells. And so the cell starts making its own SOX2 and PAX6. And this is when the magic starts. The cells do the rest. Those skin cells, they start expressing SOX2 and PAX6, and SOX2 and PAX6 then go on and turn on other brain developmental genes, which then go and turn on other brain developmental genes, and so on and so on. So we get this cascade, exactly like what happens in the neural tube and then the early brain development. And so when we originally had skin cells in a dish, we now, after about three to four weeks, have brain stem cells. We no longer have any skin cells. So those cells have completely changed what they are. What we can then do is take those brain stem cells, because these are not pluripotent, they only want to become brain cells, they're not interested in becoming anything else. So we take those brain stem cells and we put brain factors that are found during development that tell the brain stem cells what type of mature brain cell to become. And again, after a couple of weeks, what we have no longer are stem cells, but we actually have mature, live human brain cells. And not only that, we can actually make specific types of mature brain cells. We can make the dopamine cells that are selectively lost in Parkinson's disease, or the GABA cells that are selectively lost in Huntington's. So we can actually really direct the type of cells we want to study. And so this is where the magic happens. Doesn't look too spectacular, does it? But here they are, the little cells and the cells are sitting in the dish with the red liquid, the fancy red liquid that you see in all videos of scientists in labs. They grow in, 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 cell, in cell culture hoods that are actually there to protect the cells, not to protect us. Okay? And then they're put into incubators. But basically, this is what it looks like. It doesn't look too, too special, but this is, this is where all the magic happens. And it was in here that one day that my technician observed for the first time the skin cells turning into brain stem cells. So, obviously our research can take quite a long time for things to come out the other end. Several years before we get really noticeable results. This piece of work was one of those serendipitous studies where everything worked right the first time. And within six months of starting this experiment, we had taken adult human brain tissue, uh, skin tissue, and turned it into brain stem cells. And I'll never forget the day when my technician, Erin, came running in to my office and said, I think we've done it. And I thought, oh yeah, okay, seems a bit fast. <laughs> so I got up and I went and looked down the microscope and lo and behold, where there had been skin cells, there were brain stem cells. That is the beauty of my job. I get to see things for the first time that no one else has ever seen, except my technician. <laughs> What I'm really proud of, though, is that we are the only group in the world who has managed to do this with adult human skin. <laughs> so why do we want to do this? Well, obviously, we want to cure brain disease and brain injury. We can do some really cool stuff with this. We can take our human skin cells, and we can turn them into brain stem cells, and we can compare between a neurologically normal, healthy person and we can, to a patient who has a neurological disease, such as Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease. Because at the moment, as I said, we can't study human brain tissue. 
we obviously have the capability of looking at post-mortem brain tissue, and this, to date, is our gold standard. But this is end-stage disease. This only tells us what's happened at the end. We have no way of studying living human cells, except now we do. What we have produced are living human cells of which we can take normal cells and diseased cells and compare the differences. Do they grow slower? Do they have smaller cell bodies? Do they have different genes? Do they have different proteins? How do they function? But we can actually follow them all the way through the disease start, which allows us potentially to identify new drug targets and hopefully develop new drugs in which we can stop the disease earlier. The other thing we can do too is we can look at these cells for cell transplantation. The beauty of this is that we can actually take the patient's own skin cells, generate brain stem cells, and then transplant them into an area of damage, either in the brain or the spinal cord, and then allow those cells to mature. Why this is so exciting is that because the cells have come from the patient, there's no immune rejection. The body accepts them because they are the body's own cells. So what we have discovered, I think, and I believe, will truly revolutionize our ability to study and to treat brain disease and brain injury. But this is just the start of the journey. I believe the future and the capability of this technology is really exciting and there is a lot more to come. Thank you.